one of the things people ask when they encounter solidarity or our politics for the first time is often like, are you Trotskyist? What's a Trotskyist? Like, just sounds like some strange um, ism that people don't know what it is. So um, what I want to do is sort of draw out what, what was Trotsky's contribution to sort of answer that question and, sh and show the relevance of his um, politics today. Like, he was really alongside Lenin, um, the greatest contributor to Marxism since Marx in terms of what he contributed to the uh, revolutionary political arsenal that we can draw on today. He made some of the key con contributions with his um, theory of permanent revolution, which I'll talk about, with his um, extraordinary efforts both to actually organise and fight Stalin and Stalinism and the destruction of the revolution, um, and his analysis that enabled him to, to do that and sort of keep real socialist politics alive against the, the sort of destruction brought on it by Stalinism and with his theory of revolutionary strategy, the United Front, which has been brought up in some of the other sessions. I won't have time to properly go into that, but it's something that's very important um, in his politics as well. So this talk isn't going to be like a full biography of Trotsky, like everything he did um, his whole life. But I think it is very, very important that to understand that he made his theoretical contributions as an active revolutionary, as a leader of actual revolutions, as someone who was actively engaged in trying to carry out the ideas he was talking about. So he wasn't by any means a an um, armchair theorist or anything like that. Like, at the age of 26, he was the leader of... one of the main leaders of a failed uh, revolution in 1905 in Russia. Um, he was one of the primary leaders of the 1917 October Revolution. After the revolution, he was the um, organiser and um, leader of the Red Army, which defended the revolution and and so on. So he was someone who was first and foremost an active revolutionary and all his theory was an attempt to solve the questions uh, that came up in the course of, of that activity. Um, but even though it's not a biography, I wanted to go over some of the, you know, few episodes of his life just to give a sense of who he was, where his politics came from. So he gets involved in the revolutionary movement in Russia um, when he's quite young, when he's 18. His parents take fright and send him to live with a uncle who's a bit liberal but not too extreme and owns a factory and to sort of rein him in but it doesn't work unluckily for his parents luckily for the working class that doesn't work he ends up trying to organize these little revolutionary meetings in his uncle's factory and just taking any opportunity to agitate for the cause but at this early stage he's very much a beginner in what he's doing like I read this funny account of his first speech ever where it says, he got himself so terribly wound up in a sliding network of unintelligible big <laughs> words and receding hopes of ideas that his audience sat there bathed in sym sympathetic perspiration, wondering if there was any way under the sun they could help him stop. <laughs> when he finally did stop and the subject was open for discussion, nobody said a word. Nobody knew what the subject was. <laughs> Trotsky walked across the room and fell, threw himself face down in a pillow, on a pillow on the divan. He was soaking with sweat and his shoulders heaved with shame and everybody loved him. Um, <laughs> but anyway, he's like very enthusiastic but doesn't quite know what he's doing. But 10 years later, by 1905, he's one of the key leaders of an actual mass revolution in Russia. There's, they're living under czarist autocracy, an incredibly repressive, you know, feudal style regime in Russia that's, you know, waged a campaign of terror against all opposition, you know, for decades. But he's thrown into the middle of that and plays a leading role in that. So hundreds of thousands of workers are electing um, delegates to what are called workers' councils, or in Russian is called Soviets, that become a sort of parallel government, an organising centre of the revolution, a sort of the engine of the revolution that they're trying to carry out against Tsarism that, you know, are patrolling the streets, distributing resources, organising the strikes, organising self-defence, all these things are what the workers' councils are doing. And he's elected 
as the president or whatever the highest position is in the biggest city um, in St Petersburg, as this is happening across the whole country and really um, opening the prospect of a successful revolution. Just one little episode of that that gives a sense of the scale of events and his personality as well. When the revolution is facing defeat, which it is defeated, there's a meeting of the workers' council and the executive of that in a hall, which is surrounded by the military, surrounded by the police. And as they're having this meeting, they're discussing, should we go one last desperate attempt at continuing the general strike and what should we do? It's looking like we're going to be defeated. A cop comes in to read the arrest warrant into the room where they're having the meeting that Trotsky's chairing. But just as he starts to read out, Trotsky interrupts him and says, please do not interfere with the speaker. If you wish to take the floor, you must give your name and I shall ask the meeting whether it listens to you. So he puts him on the speaking list, but the cop goes away and comes back with a platoon of soldiers and he wisely says the meeting of the executive is closed. But by October 1917... Um, He's again elected the chairperson of the Workers' Council in the capital, now called uh, Petrograd for nationalist reasons. But instead of soldiers and police surrounding the Workers' Council, the forces of the Workers' Council are surrounding the Winter Palace, the centre of the capitalist government that they're in the process of overthrowing. And Trotsky is uh, the leader of that successful insurrection. The government's so... Um, and the capitalist forces are so overwhelmed that, you know, there's a big warship on the river next to the palace and there's a question, oh, should we, you know, blast the palace with the cannons? And he says, no, nah, just fire blanks at the palace and they'll, they'll surrender scared because they're, they're so uh, defeated at that point. So only 10 years after that, he's still fighting, but this time his enemy is Stalinism and the Stalinist counter-revolution, which... Ultimately, in 1940, sees him assassinated by one of Stalin's agents. So the point of that, all that, was just that his theory comes out of a life uh, committed to revolutionary activity. But I just wanted to go on now to his idea of permanent revolution, like one of his key theoretical contributions, which was essential to the success of the Russian Revolution in October 1917, but is also something you can very concretely see the relevance of today, Um, even coming out of the last session, the discussion of the Middle East, which um, I'll sort of go into. But to sort of position the theory and why it was a particular contribution at that time, I think you have to establish what was the sort of Marxist orthodoxy amongst the socialist movement in Russia, in Germany and across the world, which was basically a stages theory of revolution. The prevailing view was that to have a successful socialist revolution depended on first having, um, in countries that were feudal, a capitalist revolution against feudalism. So when you have societies dominated by agriculture, they got no working class, uh, they have no industry to end all scarcity, you can't have a socialist revolution successfully. So you have to first have a liberal, uh, democratic-style revolution like happened in France in 1789, (coughs) then capitalism will develop, industry will develop, working class will develop, and then later you can have a a socialist revolution. So that was really the prevailing idea that he was arguing against, and it makes sense in one way. In 1789, when they have a capitalist revolution overthrow the king, and everything, the, the working class is virtually non-existent. It's only uh, half a century later in 1848 that French workers in a failed revolution start to raise their own demands and, and so on. Because they've developed as a class, capitalism has developed. But, yeah, the point is in countries like Russia, which is under a czar, which is like a king, which is in a, a very undeveloped country, it hasn't had a capitalist revolution the accepted orthodoxy was you would have that type of revolution first, then later would be a socialist revolution. But Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution is really a rejection of this um, stages theory. So his starting point is something he calls combined uneven development. He basically says, once a few countries have had a capitalist revolution against feudalism, have developed industry, have become powerful that will flow on and affect the development of all the other countries in the world system. So you won't just have replicas of France and replicas of England um, happen in every undeveloped feudal country. It will not be 
the rest of world capitalism developing in parallel to the industrialised powerful states, but in uh, combination and under the impact of, of that. So what does that mean? It basically described the reality at that time, start of the 20th century, handful of Western European countries in Japan, their empires dominate the whole world. Obviously, in a country like India, um, under the British, you don't get a replica of the development that happens in in England with the Industrial Revolution and everything. Under colonialism, they're pushed backwards. If anything, they become more impoverished. Yeah, this combined uneven development in Trotsky's analysis, which sort of comes to the relevance to Russia, plays out in a particular way in Russia. So you have a feudal country, you have an undeveloped country, you have a feudal political system. But, you know, different to maybe some of the other colonies, despite this, Russia itself is an empire and it's surrounded by growing industrial powers who are arming themselves to the teeth in the lead up to at the start of the 20th century, which culminates in World War I. So under this pressure, the feudal sort of Russian ruling class is forced to establish pockets of um, industrial development, to develop an arms industry, to get investments in with money from Britain and France and technology from Britain, France and Germany to have some capitalist development amid a sea of essentially agricultural, semi-feudal type society. So that's peculiar situation of combined uneven development that happens in Russia. But that's just Trot- Trotsky's starting point. The important bit is the political in- conclusions he draws. So the first one is that in this type of situation, you won't have a, I don't know if you want to call it a um, local ruling class that develops in, a, in the way it did in France and England that will lead the revolution against feudalism. You'll have a dependent, small, weak ruling class, capitalist class, sorry, tied to uh, foreign capital that will not lead that type of, you know, bourgeois capitalist revolution. The second is that Russia, while it was incredibly backward, has, as a result of trying to um, compete with its rivals that surround it, has some of the most advanced industry in the world. And actually, the fact it was so undeveloped meant it didn't have sunken investments in the previous generation of capitalist industry. So they're just dumping in the most advanced German factories, the most advanced industry into the capital cities. What that means is while it's feudal, backward, it has a very powerful working class, hugely concentrated in the cities, which does have an interest and a capability to lead revolution. And... The final conclusion of this that is very important was that if the working class has to lead this revolution, it will not be able to limit its aims to just a capitalist bourgeois revolution that like redistributes some land to the peasants, gets an eight hour day, has freedom of press. If they conquest political power to overthrow the Tsar, they will need to go forward to socialism. So that's the sort of, I don't know, ultra condensed version of his analysis of Russia at that time and what permanent revolution is. It's a permanent revolution in that a political revolution against Tsarism can transform into a social revolution against capitalism and that the revolution in Russia also has to be permanent in spreading from Russia to the surrounding states as well. So one of the main objections to his theory was that Russia doesn't have the industrial capacity to end abundance. It's you know, you've got people farming like it's the year 1300 alongside this massive industry and they're the majority of the population. So um, Trotsky's answer to this was capitalism was a world system and the working class is a world working class. So the revolution can't finish in Russia, but it can start there and spread to Germany and, and the fully industrialised states. Yeah, this theory stands out um, in distinction to the prevailing politics in the Marxist movement. So... Amongst the Russian socialists, there are sort of two currents, the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. The Mensheviks think it's just going to be a rerun of France. And in the 1905 revolution, the argument that this leads to is that workers can't be too militant and radical. They can't arm themselves. They shouldn't strike too much because they'll scare the Russian capitalists away from the revolution into the arms of the Tsarist state. So they can't play a revolutionary role in that attempted revolution. The Bolsheviks say, no, that's wrong. The workers and the peasants can 
lead this revolution, but up until 1917, the prevailing view in the Bolsheviks was it will still be, you know, redistribute the land, eight-hour day, freedom of the press type thing. It will not be a full socialist revolution in Russia. So Trotsky's arguments, distinct from those both of these, and no way do I have time to go into it in detail, but that's what plays out in the Russian Revolution. You have a revolution that topples the Tsar in February. The government that's brought to power, though, is a capitalist government which doesn't meet any of the revolution's demands. It doesn't redistribute the land. It doesn't end the deprivation um, and political repression in the cities. And it doesn't end the war. And so by October, the working class is convinced by the Bolshevik arguments, armed with Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution at this point, that they have to go on, that the workers' councils have to seize democratic control of the whole country um, through their own, you know, working class institutions. So that's what happens in 1917. And that's what's culminating at that point in Trotsky's life when I said, you know, he's saying, um, leading the final insurrection in October. Just to go on, why is this relevant today? Well, I think you still have, obviously, combined uneven development. You have the sort of contradictions Trotsky talks about, particularly in the periphery of the global system, where you can see now the way COVID, the climate crisis, inflation, the world economic crisis is hitting countries in Africa, is hitting countries in um, the Arab world, is causing social explosions. Like we talked about the Arab Spring in the previous session. You can look at the Sudanese revolution that's been sort of ongoing and is now being cut across by conflicts between different bits of the, the military. I think the key thing is that in all these processes of massive uprisings, there is a question, are you going to be able to establish a normal liberal democratic capitalism in these countries? Are the ruling classes of those countries going to be the ones who can lead that? Or is the working class going to be the only consistent force that can take it forward? And as a result of that, is it going to limit itself just to liberal capitalism or is it going to go further? And I think in all those examples, you know, Trotsky has this quote in his 1931 book, Permanent Revolution, where he says, workers seize power in a undeveloped country it can become the prologue to a world socialist cataclysm. So he's talking about the world revolution can start in one of these countries, workers can seize power and it can spread across the world. So I think so many places around the world, that theory is desperately needed to guide how do you go forward. Like they try to give power to some liberals in a provisional government who do a deal with the military in Sudan and then you end up back with the military and then bits of the military are fighting each other. There was no strategy that was clear, this is how we can go forward and this is who can lead the fight that's ahead. So the next bit I wanted to go on to was Trotsky's analysis of the rise of Stalin, the destruction of the Russian Revolution by Stalinism and his resistance to that because I think... Whenever you talk about revolution or the Russian Revolution, that's one of the first things people say. Well, if it was so great and democratic, why did it end up as a totalitarian dictatorship ruled by this sort of merciless despot, Stalin? And I think what Trotsky's analysis enables you to do is apply a Marxist materialist analysis. It's the beginning of a materialist analysis of the USSR, of Stalin, that can basically conclude that... The problem wasn't socialist politics led automatically to Stalin. It was actually Stalin was a grave digger of the revolution and socialist politics, not just in Russia, but in the surrounding countries, were the antidote to that happening. In terms of the main aspects of this analysis, he writes about it in lots of different ways and is resisting Stalin from 1923. But he writes a book called Revolution Betrayed in Exile, which sort of sums up some of his main main arguments and he starts with the conditions that made Stalin possible and I'll just go over some of the main main ones he talks about. So the first one is the dis destruction of Russian industry and the revolutionary working class in the civil war that followed the revolution. So after the revolution world capitalism doesn't just go oh great good on you guys do whatever you want. 14 foreign armies invade the British, the Americans, Australia's even got some people under the command of the British in the north of Russia but this 
uh, civil war where, which Trotsky somehow defeats all these armies and defeats the counter-revolution. It takes a catastrophic toll on Russia. Like Russia was already an undeveloped country at the start of World War I. By the end of the civil war, the R Russian industry is one eighth of what it was in 1913. So one eighth, it's been crushed down to just a sliver of what it even was before. So that means the revolutionary working class is severely weakened. It means the actual ability to produce anything in Russia is severely weakened. The second factor is the rise of a very, very powerful and conservative bureaucracy, which sort of becomes Stalin's social base and the social base of his counter-revolution. So just one figure that sums this up is that at the end of the Civil War, there were 5.9 million state officials and 1.25 million productive workers. So you have this bureaucratic monstrosity with no working class underneath it, that could exercise democratic control over it and so on, which, it, you know, it had been the other way around when workers seized power um, initially in 1917 and in the period that followed. So Trotsky says in 1929, the majority of this officialdom which is risen up over the masses is profoundly conservative. It's this conservative layer which constitutes Stalin's most powerful support. The final factor is the failure of the revolution to spread, like, the Bolsheviks, Lenin, Trotsky, were very, very clear that if it didn't spread, you couldn't have success, it would be crushed, basically. So Lenin said literally, if the revolution doesn't spread, we're doomed. But they weren't just hoping it would spread. Like, in the period after the Russian Revolution happens, revolution ends the war in Germany, you have near revolution in Italy, 1919, 1920, brief Soviet Republic in Hungary. There's a wave of upheaval across all of Europe and that opportunity is there. Like, the ruling class is terrified of it. That's why they're sending the 14 foreign armies because they're thinking, where next? If this, if this goes ahead, the Bolsheviks set up a communist international, they call it, to spread the lessons of, of the revolution to other countries, which Trotsky plays a leading role in. But... There's no Bolsheviks in Germany. There's not the equivalent political leadership. There's not in Hungary. There's not in Italy. So these are one by one, smash, smash, smashed. Till 1923, Germany's finished. There's not going to be a revolution. And Russia is isolated. So it's in that circumstance that you get the isolation of the revolution, the bureaucracy, the destruction of Russian industry and the working class. That's what allows Stalin to rise. So... Stalin's sort of linchpin theory is what he calls, it's the opposite of Trotsky's internationalism, it's the opposite of permanent revolution. He calls it socialism in one country. And what does this mean? Really, it means abandoning socialism and exploiting your own population to compete with other capitalist states who you also do deals with if it's in the interests of yourself and the new ruling bureaucracy. And he said to a group of managers in 1931, where 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries, we must make good this lag in 10 years. Either we do this or they crush us. So saying we're gonna be a competitor in this capitalist world system. And that means reviving the exploitation, crushing any legacy of the revolution and the reign of terror that he, he sort of launched. The other thing I won't have time to go into is that counter-revolution in Russia led by Stalin also spills out to the international communist movement and destroys potential revolutions in China, in Spain, in, in a whole range of places. And that's something Trotsky writes about a lot as well. But to sum up this bit, you know, opponents of the revolution today will say Stalin was the inheritor of the revolution. And to that, Trotsky's analysis says, no, he wasn't the inheritor. He was the grave digger of the revolution. And the problem in Russia wasn't the presence of the Bolsheviks, which led automatically to Stalin. It was actually the absence of Bolsheviks in Germany, in these other countries that needed to have a revolution to, to prevent uh, Russia being isolated and, and the revolution being destroyed from within. So the thing I wanted to finish on was <laughs> Trotsky, a couple of years before the end of his life, said this communist international has become completely interrupted corrupted by Stalinism. He's driven into exile. He's not in Russia anymore um, as a result of resisting Stalin. And he declares a fourth international. The other one was the third. He declares the fourth one. We're setting up a new one that has genuine socialist politics. And in the sense it was part of his courageous 
attempt to defend the legacy of the Russian Revolution and its politics and the lessons, like, was very important. But it also, that organisation he forms has huge problems. So a couple of years after his death, his small groups of followers in all this, these countries, like, they're quite tiny in the US. The biggest one is 2,500 people. They actually end up becoming soft Stalinists themselves, which is a tragic irony. So one of the weaknesses in Trotsky's analysis is he has this whole criticism of Stalinism. He says it's a, a degenerated worker's state. These Stalinist states still have some redeeming features compared to uh, market capitalism. And his followers, in a very d- dogmatic way, don't criticise, update that theory and end up saying countries that were just annexed by the USSR with tanks like Latvia, Estonia, whatever, could name a whole bunch of them, that they're degenerated worker states. Well, there was no workers' revolution to create a worker state to then degenerate. How is it a degenerated worker state? It's Marxism without the working class at the middle of it, which isn't Marxism. So... That politics um, is extremely pernicious and leads to confusion on a whole range of other revolutions, whether it's Cuba or how you analyse Venezuela now or any of these other questions. You can't answer them with that sort of dogmatic politics. And you also see it in the sort of politics of using Trotsky's writing as a religious sort of reference where they'll read something Trotsky wrote about Algeria to say that's why sending NATO weapons to Ukraine is great. Well, that's not Marxism as a living practice, analysing the real world, which was exactly what defined Trotsky, not learning things by rote, but applying Marxism to the real world. Obviously, we're seeing like the climate crisis, economic disaster, rise of the far right, drive to war, all the things we've discussed. I think what Trotsky's politics and his defence of socialism from below offers is a clear analysis that says how there is a politics of hope, there is a revolutionary answer that can address all these questions and we can explain Stalinism, we can explain the way forward with permanent revolution in all these upheavals that are happening around the world and that that is a very precious and important thing. You can even talk about, you know, Palestine and things we touched on in the previous sessions through that lens and also just his internationalism in a context where Albo's beating the drums of war, AUKUS, we need to hate China, be afraid um, sort of thing. I think his understanding of a world working class and all our fates being tied together is also so, so important. And that's the way we see the world. That's the way we see developing military conflict, not through the, the lens of nationalism.